Hello. Um, welcome back, everyone, um, to the discussion part of our event this evening. Um, and it's a pleasure, a real pleasure, to welcome our speakers tonight, uh, Clarissa Smith, Alessandra Modin, Lola Clavo, and Mariana Echeverri. Um, the event back to our exhibition upstairs, and with particular reference to Cal Rama. Um, in Turin, in 1945, the first exhibition of work by Karl Rama was severely censored, with the Turin police removing 27 works from the show. Rama's transgressive and psychosexual representations of female desire were deemed too vulgar, too extreme, too explicit for the conservative audience of fascist Italy. As seen in the works upstairs, Rama interrogated the human body, exploring sensuality, sexuality and desire in a visceral and extreme way, with legs splayed, vaginas emitting snakes and erect tongues peripherating her landscapes. For Rama, painting ignited erotic desire and she continually searched for the erotic in everyday objects. As Beatrice Preciado, a renowned author of gender sexuality claims, Rama invented sensu sensorialism, visceral concrete art, and porn brew. In her work, she subverted the prescribed modernist depiction of female sexuality and presented the female body as both violent and mutilated, yet active and vital. Preciado comments that Rama was committed to a resistance of normalisation, and it seems crucial to acknowledge that um, Rama was actually making these works in uh, the late 1930s, anticipating the body politics which would emerge decades later and persist in critical social and cultural debate. So tonight's discussion relates to pornography and emphasises feminist and post-porn readings, and through a range of perspectives aims to unpack ideas of desire, the proliferation and place of pornography in contemporary society, and to consider ways to subvert conventional rules or defini and definitions. Sorry. And this is by no means a debate either for or against pornography, but a means to encourage constructive conversations and possible new readings on pornography and to make visible the broader academic field of porn studies. And um, so to introduce our speakers tonight and in order of appearance, um, I'd like to welcome Clarissa Smith, who is Professor of Sexual Cultures and Associate Director at the Centre for Research in Media and Cultural Studies at the University of Sunderland. She is founding co-editor of the newly launched Porn Studies Journal, the first dedicated international peer review journal to critically explore consider material considered pornographic. And with the support of the University of Sunderland, she has initiated the first large-scale study of audiences engaging, engaging with sexual media. Uh, which surveyed more than 5,000 respondents. Um, following Clarissa, we'll have a presentation from Alessandra Modin, who is a PhD candidate at the University of Sunderland, and her PhD is exploring the politics of queer feminist desires in pornographic media. She holds a BA in Visual Arts and an MA in Women's and Gender Studies, and she is currently working on The Dirty Diaries, a 2009 collection of 13 pornographic short films made by British feminists. Um, and following Alessandra, we have presentations by Lola Clavo and Mariana Echeverri. Lola Clavo is an artist and a filmmaker. Her short film, La Lucha, won the second prize at the Petra Joy Awards, which is held during the Berlin Porn Film Festival. She graduated with a distinction in MA filmmaking from Goldsmith University in London, and in 2013, she received a Poirier's Feminist Porn Award for her contributions to the field. And joining Lola is Mariana Echeverri, a multidisciplinary artist and director. She has collaborated with several art collectives from the Barcelona queer punk scene, exploring bodily, post-porn, gender and queer theory. In 2012, El Mundo Gallery held the first solo show of her work, Bestiario, a photographic series that explores the concept of desire in its most pure and emotional state. So following um, each of our presentations, we'll have a panel discussion, and then uh, following that, there will be time for questions from the audience, so we would like to um, engage you in the conversation. We are recording the event, and we're also streaming the talk, so if you could hold on for a microphone to ask your questions, um, it means that we can capture everybody's uh, contributions to this evening's event. So I'll hand over to Clarissa, and thank you all for coming.
Thank you very much. It's uh, great to have been invited here, um, and I hope everybody's not sweltering too much in the, the heat in here. What I'm going to do is um, try and contextualise a little bit some of the, uh, hopefully, some of the discussions that we might have later on in relation to um, current climates around uh, pornography and ways of thinking about both art, porn, and popular culture more generally. And I want to do that really by um, talking a little bit about what it means to start an academic journal in this area um, at, at this particular uh, juncture, at this, this time and in this place. So um, I work in a, a new university. Um, that means that it's not one of the Red Bricks or the uh, Russell Group. Um, we exist on the kind of periphery of proper higher education for some people. We don't, we don't get access to the same kinds of research funding as, say, Oxford, Cambridge or some of the London universities. We have to scrabble for the money that we do get. But one of the things that um, new universities have been particularly good at is approaching topics that other people consider, other academics might consider to be not really important enough to uh, examine. Now, of course, there are always notable exceptions to this, but in the main, most of the research in the UK into the areas of pornography, sexually explicit media more generally, have actually occurred in the new universities. And that has meant, actually, that usually they've found a home either in women, women's studies uh, courses or in the broader fields of film, media, and cultural studies. And that also has meant that, in fact, pornography has not been taken as a singular item, but there has been exploration of it according to kind of traditions and ways of thinking that have come out of uh, media studies more generally in particular, but also cultural studies, sexuality studies, and a, a, you know, an intention to examine pornography as a broad field and as an important um, form of human interaction and in, uh, mediated representations of what might be considered to be our most intimate uh, interests in, in sex. So um, it might seem a little bit surprising that actually given uh, all of the heat that arises around pornography, the fact that the, uh, in the last two decades there has been major concerns around the ways in which pornography is appearing to take over mainstream media, that uh, it is leading to various kinds of addiction marriage breakdown, divorce, etc., uh, contributing to a rape culture, contributing to um, widespread sexism. It might seem rather strange that actually within uh, many of our universities, or indeed within um, public discourse more generally, we tend to avoid talking about what pornography actually is. Okay, And we've uh, uh, Emily uh, suggested that we weren't going to try and decide whether we were for or against pornography. Um, and certainly, I, I really want to reject that kind of dichotomous thinking uh, tonight and, and to think more about, well, what does it mean to think about pornography seriously, to actually take it seriously and understand how um, certain images are pornographic, others are considered erotic, and yet more are considered to be artistic or uh, exploratory or doing something brand new. So I want to, I want to start the, with the fact that we, um, myself and Fiona Atwood, who is also a, a long-term researcher in the areas of uh, sexual media and pornography, we um, approached a couple of publishers, actually, maybe about six or seven years ago, might even be longer than that, to see whether they'd be interested in a journal. Uh, the first idea was one called Sexual Cultures, because we thought no one would go for a title like Porn Studies or Pornography Studies. And sure enough, we were turned down by a couple of large publishers. But um, we finally hooked up with someone from Routledge about 
four years ago. And they were more interested in what we had to say about the possibilities for a journal. And so uh, they were... Um, they weren't going to give us a green light, but they certainly said they'd be interested in seeing a proposal, and that's what we put together. And uh, over the, the period of time we were putting the proposal together, there were lots of things that were happening politically that actually enf uh, enhanced our arguments that the journal was necessary. So the Daily Mail, for example, which always gets a, a, an honourable mention or a dishonourable mention, depend, depending on your point of view, in any talk about sexual media or about uh, you know, media that ought to be um, censored more generally. You know, they're always on that campaigning mode, whether it's video games, film, or um, the internet. Uh, so the Mail um, had uh, begun to... Um, complain quite considerably about internet porn and what it was doing to young people. Alongside that, Claire Perry MP, um, David Cameron, clearly saw this as a, a vote winner as well to be suggesting various ways of, of clamping down on porn. And there is no doubt, of course, that, that porn is rather uh, is, is a controversial uh, area, right? I mean, we, if we're looking at images like this, this kind of a screenshot of um, uh, an opening um, a homepage for Pornhub and you know there doesn't seem to be much that one could say is redeeming or particularly interesting beyond the sexual in, in the representations that are here and so you know it can be quite difficult to understand how we might want to argue that you know pornography is good for us, right? But I'd want to reject even that question anyway, whether or not porn is good or bad for us, because it seems to me to be asking the wrong kinds of questions. And what we ought to be thinking about is how is pornography meaningful to people? What does it mean? How is it important to people? And that might mean that it's important to them in terms of being something that they reject as much as something that they embrace. And uh, so th these are some of the things that we were hoping that we would be exploring in the journal. Content on, one, on the one hand, questions around pornography and what it means, who it's for, who's looking at it, what are they doing with it, when are they doing things with it, um, who's for it, who's against it, what kinds of historical trajectories we could examine. But unfortunately, that's not generally how pornography gets to be talked about. And uh, there are too often questions that seem to be really rather um, circular and actually indeed stupid. And I want to just use poor old Jeremy as a, um, an example of this, right? He's not the worst, of course. Or if you watch people you've never met doing the most intimate of things, for the delectation of their viewers. What their viewers are doing is best not thought about. But what effect is all this exposure having upon us and upon our children? I mean, one of the things that really strikes me as, as very odd there is the idea that, well, we don't want to think about what people are doing when they're looking at pornography, but at the same time, we have to examine what the effects are on them. Well, how are we going to do that if we're not prepared to think about what it might be that people are doing when they're engaging with porn. And of course what this turns out to be is that he's only got one question actually and one way of understanding what might be happening when people are looking at porn. Sure, but what's going on here? I mean, is the whole country just masturbating more or what? Okay, so the idea actually that porn is about nothing but masturbation is one that actually I, f I find myself really... Uh, very, if, if there's anything that I'm anti in uh, debates around pornography, it's that, right? That actually porn is not simply a masturbatory tool. It is not simply a physiological um, driver. There are other things that happen. And that's why people make choices and discriminate between the kinds of porn they like and the ones they don't like. And it's important for us to start to recognise what is it, what are the um, factors that mean that some people engage with porn and others don't, 
and uh, what people like and what they don't like and where they see porn fitting into their everyday life. So we had the idea that we would uh, get this journal published. It took us two years of negotiation with Routledge and finally um, the announcement was made last year. And it was great that it would be, uh, it would be launched. We got a lot of, um, of interest in newspapers and elsewhere. And uh, various kinds of responses. Some of it, well, this is just going to be smutty. Doodles, nudie pigs, and elaborately staged sex shows are all going to be part of, of what we, um, we look at. And um, that's true. We wanted to look at historical uh, materials too. And this is the, uh, the front cover of the journal that we came up event with eventually after a number of other kinds of covers were rejected, ones that had featured naked women on the front cover, as if porn is only ever about women and that was something that we wanted to avoid and we were very pleased with this front cover. Um, but not everybody was kind of uh, welcoming of uh, what we were going to do. The Daily Mail was actually, interestingly, uh, deciding that we would be talking about Fifty Shades of Grey, which was interesting because we hadn't decided what would be in our first issue, though they thought, uh, yeah, it's, um, it would be uh, expected to be one of the topics covered in the first uh, couple of issues. And then um, there was a... Um, a, a campaign against the journal. So Routledge received a number of um, letters of complaint and then also notification that this, um, uh, this petition was going around. Um, this did feel very um, strange at the time that this happened. Uh, it, it was around about the same time as we're in now, so July, August, Everybody gone on holiday, number of stories in the press, um, and lots of journalists ringing us up and saying, well, what about this uh, petition? What are you going to do about it? And we decided that the best policy was probably just to let things ride out and not to do anything about it. But it was, um, uh, it was quite difficult not to feel worried, actually, because there were various kinds of um, discussions about whether or not our universities ought to be supporting us, um, how far people could go in boycotting the publishers, and um, comments about the journal being like a journal of murder studies from the point of view of murderers. Um, you know, this, so, you know, really quite heated ways in which people were responding to the news of the journal. And uh, of course, this was represented in the press as being um, the for and against arguments, whips up a storm, uh, that we're attacked for promoting porn, that we're going to foster the normalization of pornography, um, that we had a pro-porn stance, weren't engaging in critical debate, that this, of course, is a, the usual putting, pitting um, female academics against one another, actually, which is uh, rather boring, actually, if you're in the middle of it, but I guess it sells newspapers, doesn't it? Um, there were some others who uh, understood that, actually, perhaps the fact that they, um, there was this storm around the journal meant that it was worth publishing it, and various other people um, joined in and... and uh, and offered some reasonably positive um, uh, responses. But the key thing for us really was the problem um, in almost all of the, the responses to the journal was this idea that there is an it to be investigated, that uh, pornography is a singular um, force, that it is a singular industry, it's an enormous industry, but of course that pays no attention to the fact that there are, um, especially in, in the days of the internet, that there are sole entre entrepreneurs, people who've set up their own websites on which they, they film themselves, on which they produce work that is uh, particularly important to their own sense of self, as well as a means of communicating with other people. And yes, indeed, possibly making money too. Um, 
within the kinds of accounts that appeared in the press about us and also in the uh, petition, the idea that you know there are only there's only one reason for looking at porn, that's to masturbate. Um, but in doing so, you're learning about sex in very bad ways, that you're learning about the worst kinds of sex, um, that pornography produces forms of labour that are unlike any other forms of labour, totally different from everything else, and that they're so damaging that, you know, um, the only recourse, apparently, for some people is suicide. This isn't to... Um, to suggest that I think that pornography has no problems, right? But uh, my point is that it it has both problems and also is okay. You know, there are uh, myriad forms of pornography, and we need to pay attention to those. Um, also, we're, uh, quite a lot of the commentary about it was that we must surely be in the pay of the pornographers, that there was some personal benefit to us. Well, of course, there is personal benefit in that we are academics heading an academic journal, and that increases uh, you know, our status as academics, but as you'll know, uh, academics don't have terribly much status. Um, generally, uh, there's uh, no financial rewards for us, and whilst it might mean impact in terms of the research assessment exercises, it, it, it doesn't do terribly much else. But the key problem for us was... It's really the ways in which there's endless debate of the same issues and a kind of research inertia that just goes on more and more. Porn may be getting more and more extreme. We may be seeing things that we would never expected to see before, but that our understanding of it, it remains the same as, uh, as, as came out of second wave feminism with books like um, Andrea Dawkins' Pornography, Men Possessing Women, published in 1981, that actually we can still map what is, supposedly we can still map what's happening in pornography in its various forms through the work of, of someone like Andrea Dworkin. I, th I think there are real problems with that. So, in a way, what I want to do now um, is to suggest that, well, the journal... The journal is out, and at some point, hopefully, people will see that it has a wide-ranging remit. Of course, they're not going to see that straight away because we have four issues per year, and we see it as a long-term endeavour that will go on for, you know, well, hopefully for a decade. So, actually, in order to see what the journal is going to be, uh, one needs to take the long view we hope it's going to be a, a place for really good quality work. And one of the things that I think um, is really important that the journal hopefully will do is trace some of the historical issues and some of the ways in which questions resurface constantly and what might be interesting about why those questions resurface time and time again. So the exhibition here... Uh, that's on at the moment, is made up of works from, um, you know, more than 70 years ago, uh, works that are exploring female desire. And why is it that we still don't have proper languages for thinking about how women artists, women performers, women in popular culture, women generally, uh, how we can't understand how they talk about desire in ways that isn't uh, doesn't return to the dichotomies of slag or drag, right? The idea of good girls versus bad girls, Madonna, whore, dichotomies, which seem to return constantly in our understandings. And the thing is that actually art um, explorations of sexuality and the flirtations with pornography are not themselves brand new, as, as we can talk about um, uh, later, hopefully. So I just thought I'd, I'd run through a few very select and very quickly because uh, I'm certainly I'm in danger of running out of time. Ooh, a tiny bit. Um, Cozy Fantuti, Fanny Tutti um, in the 1970s with uh, her um, explorations of, of, um, of sexuality and, and uh, transgression. Um, of course, Annie Sprinkle in the post-porn 
um, modernist, uh, Jeff Coons and Chicholina. Uh, we've also got Jemima Staley and her uh, work Strip from the 1999, which uh, questions power and voyeurism in the art world through uh, a set of, um, of images of her stripping in front of the curator, the artist, and, and others. Um, exhibitions like Pop Life at the Tate and Seduced, Art from Antiquity to Now, which is at the Barbican, um, it's probably about six or seven years ago. But before that, in the 19, late 1980s, What She Wants, an exhibition of uh, women artists and their explorations of the erotic male body. There have been lots of ways in which um, art and pornography have kind of meshed and, uh, and come together and then moved apart. And it's not entirely one-way traffic, of course, because if we think about Andrew, Andy Warhol's blowjob, um, which, of course, is not, uh, not explicit in, in showing bodies, per se, but it is explicit in the idea of, of pleasure. And then K.R. Boosie's Requiem, which is a, a, a riff on Andy Warhol's blowjob, um, which has influenced, which we can see the influence of, in the pornographic website, Beautiful Agony, where people upload uh, videos of themselves in uh, the throes of orgasm or in the process of achieving orgasm, um, getting to orgasm. Uh, interesting ways in which actually art and pornography um, filter through to each other. I could have talked a bit more, uh, I would have liked to have talked a bit more about the notion of the obscene in relation to art, but um, anyway, maybe that's something we'll do in the questions. The, um, the things that I, I guess I want to um, suggest are important for us is thinking about how art pornography, erotica, popular culture more generally, help and enable people to think about the ways in which they understand themselves as uh, sexual beings, and what spaces there are for thinking about fantasy, for understanding transgression, thinking about how we might understand what goes on when People talk about wanting to experience fantasy, which is certainly something that people uh, talking about their use of pornography emphasise that fantasy is an important dimension for them. And so my final things are, uh, what, what do we need to think about in terms of uh, sexuality? How is it produced? Who gets to speak about it? Who gets to produce uh, work around it um, and how might we understand sexuality as something that's practiced and how it comes into people's art practices and what are art, porn and popular culture speaking? What are they saying about sex and sexuality? And I'll leave it there. Thank you. I would like to thank uh, Nottingham, Nottingham Contemporary for the invitation, and I hope that my uh, presentation would not be too academic or too boring. Um, I would like to start with a quote by the artist Barbara Kruger, who said, I see my work as a series of attempts to ruin certain representations, to displace the subject and to welcome a female spectator into the audience of men. And I think this seems to ring true also about um, feminist porn as well. Um, feminist porn has been around since the early 80s, and especially from the early 2000s, the production of feminist porn have been more and more diverse, and it is said to be shaping the field through the challenge of dominant representations of gender, sexuality, race, ethnicity, class, ability, 
um, age, body type, and other identity markers. This is a quote by Corny Trouble, one of the um, pioneers, we could say, of queer feminist porn nowadays. And I think it um, summarizes very well what um, feminist porn might be. Um, and feminist porn as um, an ethical political impulse, similarly to other feminist projects. It could be seen as a form of sex positive, pleasure positive activism. And it goes into the fertile lineage of feminist film, per performance, and body art spanning from the 16 onwards. And they constitute both a political antecedent and a visual genealogy interlinked with the carnal aesthetics. During the late 60s and early 70s, feminism fundamentally changed contemporary art practice critiquing its assumptions and radically altering its, feminist, its structures and methodologies. And in this particular time frame, feminist art strived to reinforce two central tenets. The personal is political and all representation is political. And this is, rings true again for, uh, for feminist porn. And I'm, here I'm talking, about, I'm talking about feminist porn in very, very general terms. Um, and it has to be said that, I, uh, that a desiring woman body has always been considered problematic, abject, and highly charged in many, many negative ways in Western cultures and societies. And feminist porn is helping, broadening, and intensifying representational vocabularies of sexual desires without leaving pleasures and, uh, and politics and ethics behind. And it's also um, interconnected consciously or unconsciously with feminist art in general. And I want to make some examples. Uh, one of the most recent one is the experimental DIY short film, Dear Gis, uh, which seems to play with the value export performances of the nine minute short film, uh, Mann und Frau und Animal, uh, a three part allegory of gender where she, where she masturbates in the bathtub. Um, and Dear Giz features the genderqueer performer Giz Lee masturbating in a bathtub as well, while incorporating a voiceover that narrates uh, pieces of letters received from fans, um, describing how inspiring and helpful it was to see um, their embodiment and exploration of gender, sexuality, and identity for their personal explorations and acceptance of themselves. And in both works, pleasure and the investigation um, around identity and subjectivity are uh, entwined. Another example is the feminist porn collection Dirty Diaries, produced by Mia Engberg. In, 19, uh, in 2009 in Stockholm, and it was financed by the Swedish Film Institute through public funding, yeah, um, which means tax money for porn, basically. And, um, and its manifesto, which guided the production of the short films, um, approximate both an art manifesto and a political one. And I want to talk a little bit about the first um, short of the collection, which is very, very diverse. Um, and this particular uh, short called Skin um, helps to challenge dominant representation of gender and sexuality through a particular disorientation of desire through display with this um, bodysuit that uh, that is cut through the, um, through the short. And this is linked with, um, feminist, with a feminist visual genealogy and feminist performance art as well. And it connects with um, Yokono performance called Cut Piece. Um, and amongst other things, through the cutting of the suits, they both reflect on power, uh, power dynamics and relationships. And um, if we want to think specifically about post-porn, 
and I think uh, Mariana and Lola will talk more about this, uh, there are some critics that find that it has some visible German connections with, for example, the films by Monica Troit. And I think it's also connected with performances like Valley Export, um, Action Pants, and Karoli Schneemann autobi autobiographical trilogy. And for instance, Maria Yopis' Chat Roulette, I think it's a sort of personal sexual tale where the everyday also enters the frame in the form of her pet cat, not dissimilarly from Schneemann's fuses. I don't know if you're familiar with her cat Kitsch, which is a uh, protagonist of various other short films. Um, another short by the German uh, Julia Ostertag uh, called Sex Junkie reflects on her own relationship with sex, love, and desire and it's connected with the aesthetics of um, Lydia Lunch, Richard Kern, Nick Zed, and the New Wave Cinema, this, um, the underground filmmaking of the New York Lower East Side of the end of the 70s and beginning of the 80s. And Fanny Sporn is very much aware of, it, of its lineage, influences, and inspiration. Uh, for instance, we can see it in Emily Jouvet, uh, too Much Pussy and Much More Pussy, um, which are, Much More Pussy is the X-rated version of the first one, basically. Um, and they are described as a sex-positive road movie and explicit documentaries about the wild adventures of seven women on a performance art tour. And Sadie Loon, one of the performers involved uh, engages in the reenactment of the famous performance by Yannick Sprinkle called Public Service Announcement. And this performance by Sprinkle has signified, some critics argue, um, the passage from the production of mainstream porn to a porn with a political content and the aim of a social transformation. And I want to talk also about the production side of things, basically. And feminist porn is invested in practical, ethical, political terms um, in this as well. And not only, um, we will see a, a bit later, not only production is talked about, but also representation is talked about by the very agents who are involved in feminist porn. And like in feminism in general, there are indeed some tensions and productive contradictions in feminist porn. Um, and some of them can be traced in the discourses around how it should be focusing more on the ethical aspect at the level of production, and some others on how it should show positive and therefore ethical representations of women, queer, and trans individuals, for instance, in their sexualities and identities. And this is specifically connected to the discussion in early feminist film criticism of the 70s, which focused on the positive or negative representations of women on screen, and on the later identity politics driven gay and lesbian studies. And recently, very, very recently, the focus has been on organic fair trade mode of production and distribution. And ventures like um, Pink Label TV are trying to build a business model for porn that explicitly speaks of and operates through a feminist ethics, which could appeal to feminist audiences. And the website reinforces the notion of a fair trade model through a distribution policy that grants profits directly to the directors of the porn production hosted. And in addition, the, uh, uh, an ethics of production is explicitly stated on the site. And Sid Blakovich, one of the co-producers of Pink and White Production, performer and multimedia artist, comments on how this kind of endeavor is assembled around a different model from the usual uh, capitalist American production. In this endeavor, porn production is about a DIY ethic that has its, that has its most recent antecedent in punk subculture, sustainability, as in fair trade system that highlight the sociality of the business practice 
and a community that gathers around specific values and identities. And this positive apparatus created includes community building, thanks to pornographic material that is seemingly inserted in a circuit where producers, directors, and performers share the values of the audience they are marketing to. Thus, these consumers are potentially engaged in form of consumption that in inextricably and explicitly bind together certain cultural and economic choices more than any other pornographic production, perhaps. And uh, performers at the level of production ethics uh, are very aware, seemingly, of self-care and aftercare practices. And, they, um, and these practices foreground their own and the co-performers' well-being. And they are distressing also individual agency. And feminist sport trailblazer Tristan Taormino points out how caring for performers is one of the key requirements of fair trade organic feminist porn. In order to bring feminist values into mainstream straight porn for women and men, Tormino implements standard practices of the industry with other strategies in order to care for her performers while presenting them as three-dimensional human beings. For instance, also with the help of interviews which are intercut with the erotic action, where sex workers have the rare opportunity uh, to speak for themselves, something that is rarely seen uh, in mainstream media. And the independent hardcore feminist filmmaker and producer Petra Joy shares similar concerns and practices too. And feminist directors like them strive to create a positive work environment for everyone through various practices on and off set. And they seem also to realize what feminist um, scholar care, um, called an ethics of care. And all these fair practices benefit workers because the focus is on their humanity and value, but they also create for feminist porn a sort of structural makeup, a set of discourses around, around it as a genre in opposition to the mainstream and as a niche market. These feminist directors are affecting the field from within in multiple ways, but they're also having an impact on the perception of porn, its producer and audience, and on the actual consumption of porn. They might meet the demand of an audience that may or may not identify as feminist and that is dissatisfied with the industry as it is or as they perceive it to be. In the meantime, they are supporting the development of a new consumer base that perhaps stayed away from porn because of worries about harms to its performers, but who may now feel more comfortable with the possibilities of ethical productions. So the audience might feel the fulfillment of an ethical condition of looking at the meeting point of desire and responsibility. But also there is another um, issue, and it's around content. Uh, and what is represented and how it's represented. So talking about feminist porn, the scholar Ansabo outlines the importance of high cinematic production values and a progressive sexual political commitment and a set of characteristics thought to espouse a fair trade logic of representing desires. And this discussion over content is polarizing to opposite direction with different ethical premises. So Sabo contends that m porn is more than workplace. It's essentially a general delivery, delivering a discourse on sex and gender as it seeks to arouse the viewer. And if content of this discourse isn't feminist, the porn isn't feminist. Um, Petra Joy goes further and suggests that by definition, Feminist porn should subvert conventional rules and representation and present equality of the sexes. For instance, she opts for boundaries around the type of sexual acts shown in her films and in how they are performed. And another vision of femini et feminist ethics around content is present, for example, in the words of the erotic writer, film director, and producer, Erika Lust, when she argues that it is impossible to label certain sexual acts or preferences as feminists and some other as non-feminists. 
And this sort of polarization around content is sort of a um, slippery slope, let's say. And it reminds me the diatribe of the feminist sex wars of the 80s, in a way, where a strong opposition was set by women against violence in pornography and media against BDSM practices because believed to be in tune with patriarchal violence and policing thus some feminist desires. So discursively representing certain practices, acts and desires as less degrading than others and thus implicitly more feminist is linked with the attempt of uh, positive representation of women and women's sexuality. But positive is itself a politically an ethically fraught label, as it carries an implicit value judgment within it that will always be subjective and culturally specific. But that, in the mesmerizing space of the profilmic, can convey the impression of neutrality. But also we have to think about the complexities of the audience readings and investment and that certain women or feminist preferences could have been marketed to us and arguably mirror simplistic cultural construction of femininity. And I would like to finish with a quote um, by Downing and Saxton, which says, if we accept that filmmaking or other, you know, or any other representational practices take place in the realm of the ethical, since these decisions involve a negotiation between desire and responsibility, then every aesthetic decision has an ethical dimension. And I would like to stop here and leave the floor to Mariana and Lola. Hello? <laughs> Sorry, uh, maybe you should close your eyes because this is not in the right order. I need to fix it. <laughs> so don't look. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now. All right, so uh, I am Mariana. She is Lola. Um, we, uh, we've started a, a collective called Exotic Loom a few years ago. Uh, so uh, we're going to make some short, briefly, presentations about ourselves, and I'll start. Um, so as uh, Emma mentioned, I was involved with, um, to call it, to give it a name, was like the queer punk scene in Barcelona, a uh, few years ago and still because, well, they're my friends and family. So I'll start with this image. Uh, to tell you about um, this is uh, so how I see porn and to talk about porn for me it was uh, much of a like a personal uh, experience um, we started not all at the same time but everyone much with a, a natural exploration with sex sexuality and gender fluidity um, as a, a group of friends and people we know that were, have the same interests and we were all at the same time in Barcelona, which is a fairly free uh, city to explore these things. Um, we are a group of um, 
many were artists, uh, performers, poets, writers, and we were just, uh, it felt like we were experimenting and at the same time thinking about it and then writing about it and working with that. So um, to talk about it, it's, uh, it's always to talk about uh, not just what I did, but uh, collaborations mainly. Because in a, we could say we were a community, although some people might not agree with that term. But um, we, it's important for me to mention other people as well who helped me build this idea and what I think, what I feel about porn nowadays. So this was like early 2000s in Barcelona. So Maria Llopis, um, I think Alessandra mentioned it, and a uh, friend and also a, a writer and an artist. Uh, also Lola collaborated with her um, in other projects and the three of us. And now she's, I put this picture here with the baby because she just had a baby and she's uh, working on her book called Subversive Maternity. So she's like, um, this, uh, this idea of porn and post-porn um, evolved in, in her recent interests of uh, maternity and the orgasmic birth and these things. She knows better. So Itzi Arcega, this first picture here, is from the, the book um, Femmes of Power from Della Grace Volcano. Um, she was interviewed. She's a writer. This was a book as well. Um, I've heard the first book um, that we made together, the cover, and I'm part. Uh, she interviewed me and a lot of other. Um, she would call, Deven, Devenir Perra would be something like becoming a bitch, kind of. Um, so it's about, um, she's very interested in subversive femininities. That's what she works with. Um, those are other books of her. And Diana, Diana Torres, she's, um, uh, so her, AKA <laughs> Porno Terrorista. She has this uh, website, the book called Porno Terrorismo. I think it, you can understand what it means. Um, uh, she's a poet, she's a performer, and she's a very, uh, very interesting artist, very radical. Uh, if you check her website, she has a quite uh, interesting manifesto. Um, also, uh, it's all porn, sexuality, and art related, like the other ones. Um, here, this is the... Um, so, in Barcelona, we had a few... Well, in Spain, a few... Um, get together like conferences and uh, workshops and uh, performances that will last for a few days, like three days. We had the Postborn Marathon in 2000, if I'm not mistaken, 2001, uh, run by Beatriz Preciado. We also talk about her. And uh, kind of uh, uh, everyone started at that time doing more consciously, more like what we are doing in our daily lives with our friends and all the sex and these things that we've been thinking about. Let's make this into art, which is what we do. Let's write about it and let's do performances and create workshops um, so, and be more conscious, uh, conscious about it. Um, so this was Art Eleco, which was, uh, Maria called it the Disney World of Porn, which is, I think, yeah, 2005 was a really great experience. Um, and everyone was there, uh, all our friends that, well, we all became friends throughout the years. Um, Beatriz Preciado, Annie Sprinkle, we just talked about her. Um, Julie Shang, Lydia Lunch, and well, a, a lot of people got together this year. It was really special and new things created from that. So it's a, it was very important time. So here it is, okay. Because I'm, I'm trying to make it <laughs> brief, so it was just some highlights, important images. Um, but this one, this is uh, My Sexuality is an Art Creation, is a documentary made by Lucia Egaña. She's a, she's a friend, she was with us, she was uh, participating, collaborating, we're all together. So she made this documentary, uh, and it's a very, very good one, because at the time, there was like the... The other journals uh, were talking about our work. People that we felt like were from outside were analyzing it. And uh, it, this documentary is um, it's really good because she's part of it. And, she, you know, she created this 
film with interviews and um, it's quite funny because it represents a lot of uh, the, the scene, if you can call it, with uh, people have really different opinions sometimes. So it's not like we were doing something specific or everyone was doing a kind of porn or not even everyone had the same views on porn or feminism is um, at the time. So it's quite chaotic, but uh, so it's really interesting and really... It's a very eclectic group of people. Um, so more uh, relate. Uh, sorry, I put here the the website where you can buy it. That's distributed. I think it's it's kind of uh, a good documentary. So more uh, centered on what I did personally. I was studying fine arts at the time, like in the early two thousands. So as a final project, those those three uh, photographs over there. Uh, the bestiario um, were more like my uh, take on it as more uh, I am more interested in uh, creating fictional environments or uh, the production of culture through fiction and fiction fictional landscapes fictional characters so um, I work I did bestiario uh, that was a few years ago and then in I think 2010 or nine, I did uh, self-devouring, and in a way was like a turning point uh, in the work I was doing. I, I think I got a bit <laughs> fed up with porn, and I was too involved, and I, uh, I needed to create a distance. Um, and so, not just because of that, but because of the experience that I was living, I did it, and it was like a, a way to stop it for a while and to create this dramatic uh, pause. Um, yes, okay, so, and briefly, that's uh, my presentation, and um, now, Lola. Hi, so I'm Lola. <clears throat> uh, I just wanted to also explain a bit who I am, what I'm coming from, because some people confuse us, and uh, things I'm also part from this Barcelona scene, which I wasn't, so um, I come from a traditional film school, those are some friends of my uh, my films from film school. Um, so I was, uh, my education was very industry-oriented, uh, film directing, uh, to just learn the normal mainstream films. Um, but I started to be very interested in sexuality from my first films. So <coughs> this is some of them. Uh, one of the films I made when I was studying was Null of Lost which was very controversial at the time in the school and outside. The, that was my first film that was shown in a gallery. Um, this film uh, is about how to explore uh, your own sort of sexual desire, how not to judge people for what they do when they're having sex or they, you know, what they desire, what they like. Um, for me, sex was always very interesting uh, in terms of uh, making films about it, because it's, it's a way of seeing social, social structures by analyzing sexual behavior, behavior is very, I don't know, it's very clear to me the relation between these two things. So, so, so uh, social structures are clearly sort of mirrored on sexual behavior. So that was my main uh, reason why I was doing this. So then I finished school, I moved to London and in London, I uh, discovered queer theory. Uh, I didn't know anyone that was doing that at the time. That was while Mariana was in Barcelona. Um, and <coughs> then with queer theory, I started thinking about genders and all this. And I wrote Switch, which is the film that then uh, got the award last year in, at the Poor Years Awards. Um, with Switch, I just wanted to talk about gender roles. It was a, I was trying to get a really simple sort of idea of how masculinity and femininity uh, are quite fluid, and you can play with these roles at any point, and anyone can play with that role. So <clears throat> I'm going to show a clip, a, sh a few short clips of this film. It's 20 minutes, or 25, so I'm just going to show three minutes of it, so it's, it's just like a taste.
Me das uno. Here you can see a making of when we were cleaning the fence. Um, <coughs> so it was, <coughs> this film was very important for me, not just the film, but because I met Mariana and I met Maria Lopez, and that led to lots of collaborations and a discovery of other kinds of <coughs> films. Sorry. So with Maria, I made some other films, mainly as her cinematographer or first AD. Uh, some Alessandra mentioned one, like Chat Roulette or Real Life. Uh, those are also making up from when we were doing this. And we also made recently this DVD compilation, which is a DIY compilation of uh, some of our films and some of other people's films that we think they need to be out there and they need to uh, reach people. That we get quite a lot of emails of people trying to find our films and where can we see this kind of stuff. So that's why we made this. Um, but it's completely DIY and we don't make any profit of it. So <laughs> it was a bit of a disaster. Um, and then with Mariana, obviously we became a couple and then um, we started working, also collaborating. And then it's when we decided to create Exotic Loom as a way of having a platform, yeah, to, mm -hmm. um, to explore uh, sexuality. Yeah. <clears throat> and she's gonna talk about it. <laughs> So, um, yes, we made Exotic Loom like, uh, maybe two years ago, yeah, um, and also because uh, as an artist and she as a film director, we were also working uh, in um, other, other fields, I mean our current interests are not directly related to porn, so, and at the time, so, but we still, we are still interest in, uh, interested in, and um, we keep uh, seeing other films and um, films that are uh, called porn and those that are called cinema and sometimes there's like there's no connection between two they were like two sep two separated so we haven't done we have a lot of ideas that we want to work on but we mainly uh, did a corpus call which we're gonna play now um, and also um, we created some performances in London mainly. Um, this one was in Portugal, 
of just screenings. We created a performance with this artist called Philippe Cagna uh, and at a festival in London. Also, we were at the gallery where we uh, screened the documentary I told you about from Lucia. Uh, like, generate some events and performances. And we did, um, yes, and we did Corpus Call which was uh, quite uh, well received in a lot of festivals and uh, it's where we met Alessandra, uh, she interviewed us uh, last year at the Berlin Porn Film Fest, um, where, well, I'll, we'll see how it is and then if you have questions about it, maybe I'll show you first. Oh, okay.
Okay. So, I'll leave it to you to interpret as you please, and if you have questions, then um, that's it. Also, thanks uh, to Emma and Nottingham Contemporary for inviting us. Thanks. wanted us to do something of a round table now, hadn't you? But I, I feel almost like we should really just open oh, up to great. questions because just yeah. because people sitting there for a long time yes. and, and hopefully you have questions that you want to pose. Um, we do have a roving mic as well, so if you just want to um, raise your hand, if anybody has any comments even yep. or um, observations. Hello, uh, my name's John. I, I want to ask about the politics of pornography because it strikes me that um, there's a narrative across the 20th century, whether it's um, the growth of Hollywood movies and the Hayes Committee imposing curbs right up to the UK with the D.H. Lawrence, Lady Chatterley Society, then the scrapping of the Lord Chamberlain's powers over theatre. So it's almost as if it's been one, uh, kind of two steps forward, one step back. Um, we are in the midst uh, of a recession right across Europe. We've been fighting the war against terror for 10 years. Are there signs that we're seeing any kind of liberalisation in terms of access and the making of pornography being rowed back or attempts to row back? Because it strikes me that politically, um, pornography and its accessibility is a bit like a weather vane or a weathercock in terms of you know, liberty. Uh, and we're on, it strikes me, a cut between kind of liberty and what's available and what's allowed and repression and what's not allowed. Okay, <laughs> I'll answer that question. And um, I think we are in very interesting times, actually, with regards to censorship. We've got, uh, we've got the legacy of the last Labour government, if we're talking about the UK, the uh, legacy of the last Labour government and its Criminal Justice and Immigration Act, which um, includes provisions around extreme pornography, um, and which has uh, outlawed possession. Uh, so it hasn't been about making or distributing pornography in recent years, it's been about the possession of it. And of course, you know, there are areas on which I think lots of people feel that there is some consensus around child porn imagery, or as other people might want to call it, um, images of, of uh, child sexual abuse. Um, people are agreed that those are images that they, or a lot of people are agreed, those are images they don't want to have available. But we've also got a government that is moving incrementally towards more and more censorship. So we've got the filtering proposals with ISP, ISPs. They're not even proposals, they're actually in place now. Um, and and uh, another bill moving through Parliament at the moment which will um, criminalise rape porn. But it's a bit difficult to know what rape porn actually will be under those uh, uh, those restrictions and it does seem like we are actually moving as you say two steps forward one step back all the time um, and across Europe there are you know moves in Iceland to ban pornography in the US they're looking at uh, the situation here with the ISPs and thinking they might like to use it and that being suggested around Europe as well as possible ways to go forward. And, and of course, we have always been the most heavily censored anyway. We've got quangos like Atford and the BBFC. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, interesting times, I guess. Yes. And, and probably, as you say, a barometer as well, actually, of of ways of thinking. And I think, think whilst there are... Um, 
moves to suggest that this is about uh, fostering better representations of women. I'm not entirely sure it operates in women's interests always, but I don't know whether you want to say anything about... I mean, I, when, when you were talking earlier, I was wondering what issues you might have come up against in Barcelona with regard to making and distributing pornography. Uh, well, <clears throat> I'm not so... Uh, I don't know that much about distributing uh, pornography. But honestly, um, at the time... I'm, I don't live there anymore. It was actually quite, f quite a free environment. Mm -hmm. um, Barcelona has special rules. <laughs> and... Um, uh, you can go around those rules, and we actually did a lot of uh, performance in the streets, and we didn't. We had trouble with other things, but actually, no. It, I mean, if it was in uh, art context, also, so it's permitted when it's art. So <laughs> we have that if you were at a gallery, or if it was part of an art event, or uh, performances. We had. Um, places to do it and sometimes they would uh, a, a, a group of a collective called Postop did a lot of things on, on the streets at Las Ramblas which is famous um, and um, they were pushing it until the, the police would come and they were able to do a lot of things even a few years ago it's um, Barcelona it's kind of a like a crazy city, <laughs> so a lot of things are happening in the streets, and uh, there was not much problem with that. But this has changed now. Yeah. <laughs> mm. uh, well, I mean, it's like until a certain point, then suddenly there is a problem, and it's a very hardcore problem. <laughs> but, yeah. I remember it's a quite free environment. Do you have another question? One of the things that I'd be interested in hearing your opinions on, there's quite a lot of discussion at the moment about the Nordic model of sex work and whether or not to introduce, um, you know, different aspects of that into legislation in the UK. Um, now, there's, um, you know, as far as I'm aware, there, there seems to be um, a number of different models. Um, I think it's New South Wales in Australia that's uh, particularly liberal, as well as the Netherlands. I was just wondering, um, you know, if you were aware of this model and what would be the impacts um, of this where it's go through? Would it be um, in, in, in any way uh, progressive for women or feminism, for example? I'm not much aware of the legislation right now, or I'm not working directly with porn, so I, I, I'm sorry, Carl. Okay. Um, <laughs> Answer that. Yeah, I, there's, there's an awful lot of, um, of debate around the Nordic model. Uh, personally, I don't, I don't subscribe to the idea the Nordic model would be particularly workable. Um, I mean, there are implications, obviously, for, um, you, you know, there is a tendency to separate, and I find I do it myself in my own work, around separating pornography and prostitution, and, um, yeah, I use the two P words, uh, sex work. I mean, pornog pornography is a form of sex work, right? And uh, certainly there are ways in which I think there is a, a kind of Nordic model that's being adopted in the UK around pornography, which is to criminalise possession, to outlaw certain forms of uh, sexual expression, to um, constantly talk about those people who are working within pornography as victims to be rescued. So I think I think there are lots of connections there that and, and clearly, you know, the ideas around stigma and, and uh, other ways of talking and constructing pornography as a problem has connections to sex work, but it probably isn't, you know, this isn't the best place for us to be discussing those things here simply because 
other members of the panel haven't. <laughs> and uh, I, 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 yeah, I, that's maybe something we could pick up afterwards. <laughs> I guess it's uh, an issue. But, yeah. uh, maybe it's something that um, Alessandra could feel in with the in terms of ethics and um, thinking more um, constructively about. Um, people who are involved in the porn industry and thinking more about like the ethics mm. of those uh, performances. Of course, it's not really ethics, though, is it? It's about regulation, and mm. regulation doesn't necessarily make for ethical behaviours, and I think that's possibly we, we one we of the we things we feminist we porn is trying to achieve, yes. is a form of ethics that comes from within rather than um, outside as regulation. And we are made to believe that regulation are neutral, that are not, you know, part of a certain discourses and this kind of regulation about the Nordic model are built upon, I, I suppose, on certain second wave feminist ideas about um, women, about sex work, about ideas that um, are linked with uh, false consciousness and respect for oneself, probably. Um, I'm not researching too much about sex work, to be honest, so I wouldn't be a uh, good, uh, I don't know, comfortable, comfortable, comfortable. comfortable in discussing too much <laughs> about sex, wo sex work regulation, probably. Um, my question is, why is pornography, it seems to me that pornography is doomed to be boring, in that desire is always about getting something that you can't have, it's always about deferral, it's the roll and bought striptease thing. Because pornography gives you what you want, presumably it's always going to therefore not really give you what what you desire. What do you think of that? Maybe that's just a very male <laughs> question. So, uh, so you're saying desire is about something that you cannot have and because pornography gives you what you want, it's not giving you desire. Well, I think that's very subjective. I don't think desire is about something you cannot have, so... I don't think pornography will give you or not give you what you want. I mean, it's so personal. I, I don't think it's to, to be boring. It depends. There, there are all kinds of porn, and as Clarissa said, and we all, I mean, we all know it's, uh, there's so much porn now, uh, all kinds of porn um, happening, and people are very yeah. interested, and because people are uh, also... It's a, it's a great time to explore that. So if you ever wanted, a lot of people are doing it now. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's all different what's out there. That's interesting. One of the things that, that scandalizes people about porn, actually, is that they, they get what they want. And that's what upsets people about it, that it lays, lays bare the nature of our desires. Um, and, and doesn't allow us to kind of... Um, uh, so you, you're talking mo more like about repression of our desires I, and uh, when we see it in porn, it's like we're... I, I guess I'm, I'm thinking of more kind of psychoanalytic models about desire. People like Lacan talking about how, how what we desire is, is always something other from um, the other of the other and all that sort of punning, uh, yeah. endlessly <laughs> opaque sort of stuff. But it, it, it just struck me watching your, your film, which I enjoyed very much. I, I didn't think your film was, was boring in that sense. Ah, sorry. I, I <laughs> I, you I, could I, think it was boring. I, so. No, no I, I just, you know, I was just curious that, 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 that there seemed to be a tension about how a lot of the French understand desire and how pornography fills the gaps. But of, one of thing, I mean, pornography is always fiction. So your desire is, is it's never going to be real if you're watching a screen. I don't know, it's, it's a different thing. No. Yeah. And I think it is quite interesting to think about where 
where you're viewing, you know, and how much you might be viewing and what, what you're doing, and, and that something that is boring on one occasion is, is, is endlessly fascinating on another. And, and there, there is a real thinness about the notion of desire, I think, sometimes in, in uh, some of these models, that somehow desire is always always about lack, for example, something that you're lacking, but actually it might be about something that you want to discover, which is, is not the same as lack, is, mm -hmm. is about something much more generative and, and productive. And, and I think it's, um, you know, the argument about porn being boring is one of the, <laughs> the key things that are, are laid at its door. But, you know, that's, that's usually, um, you know, yes, of course, there's plenty that's boring and there's also plenty that's really exciting. Yeah. And, but not for everybody and not always at the same time. And, and sprinkle at the, yeah. at the marathon that kind of make everyone start doing their own collectives and things. She said that if you don't like porn, make your own. And that was like the... Yeah. Yeah. Or the motto yeah. for everyone. And also, it's, it, it's, you know, you don't have to like all of it, right? That's yeah. no one requires. Not even, <laughs> you don't even have to. I mean, it's not it's so much about liking or not liking. Even when you're doing something that might be seen as porn, even if you have a different idea of it, it's not so much about, well, I talk from. As I think it's not so much about liking it, but about exploring something that we are uh, concerned, curious, that we have an interest, and we might desire or might not, but it's like an exploration. It's like, you know, sexuality is all about experimenting and exploring. So as, an, as artists and filmmakers, at least, that's what we try to do, so, mm -hmm. even if we desire it or not. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I, th I think... You know, there is a problem about just labelling pornography as boring because it is a, a, it's a kind of limit word which then doesn't allow for other kinds of, of thinking about what, what sexual representations might be. And, you know, to think in terms of what, well, personally, as, an, as somebody who analyses pornography as, as part of my research, my first port of call is actually my own responses and I do find things boring and I look at it and I think well why why is that boring to me what what isn't working about that for me what and not not to suggest it ought to work but the, there's something in that that moment when it doesn't function or even when it does you mentioned Bart you know the idea of the punctum that that also happens in in pornography that something you know people talk about a giggle between performers that, that turns it from being quite ordinary, you know, workaday stuff into something really magical for them. And that, I, think, I think those are things that, you know, we ought to pay attention to in the detail, mm -hmm. how, how things um, speak to us in yeah. particular ways. Oh. I think we had a question yeah, in the... Sorry. Hi. Yeah. Um, this is not my area of expertise, so I'm sort of thinking out loud, really. I know there's a, an acceptance that the internet porn is bad, that people who work in the sex industry are victims, and that pornography is big business. But I'm wondering if the huge growth of kind of the webcam and incredibly personal pornography will actually give a voice to an awful lot of other people who may not be informed by a kind of feminist man manifesto, but are maybe creating tiny, tiny manifestos for very tiny audiences. And how do you feel about the kind of amateur DIY end of internet pornography? Um, I read something recently uh, that was questioning the ethical implication of uh, amateur porn. And in a sense, it's, uh, in a way, there's a, the possibility of democratization of representation of your own uh, desire, sexuality, and pleasure, and body, and et cetera, et cetera. On the other end, thinking about uh, the ethical practices of performers, for example, this article questioned actually the ethics of amateur pornography, uh, that is, um, uh, streamed in many, many ways on the internet. 
and maybe um, appropriated by some major big conglomerate distributing free videos. I'm thinking about Pornhub, for example. So um, it is, of course, a democracy, democratizing device. Sorry, my English is going away. Um, but still, there are questions around that, I guess. Mm. There are, but then there are questions around YouTube and yeah. almost every other social media form that we use. And I, I, I do think that there's that user-generated pornography has potentials, not for everybody, but for some people to to really offer, um, a, you know, a, a very liberatory force for them. And I, th I think it's um, important to recognise that, you know. For many groups, queer, uh, gay men, lesbian women, transsexual, um, you know, uh, minority sexualities, pornography has been one of the few places in which they have some space in the main mainstream and, and some visibility, and, and, and maybe that isn't necessarily the kinds of visibility that... Uh, that take them forward always, but but you know that this is that sexuality is is clearly very important to people, and being able to speak your own sexuality and own it yourself is important. And it does seem to me that the internet allows that in ways that weren't possible previously, because you can join with other people across the globe in doing it. And of course, that sounds rather maybe naive. Um, I, I do think that there are issues around it, but I'm not, I'm not convinced that um, the, the notion of some kind of ethics that fits for everybody is necessarily uh, something that I would be holding or user or prosumer um, individuals too, you know, that actually sometimes people want to take risks and, and they, they are entitled to, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah, so. <laughs> okay, so one of the filmmakers who was mentioned, you said they uh, tried to sort of make the performers back into three-dimensional people with the cut interviews into the performances. I mean, do you think that pornography has the capacity to stop the performer just being objectified? I find it doubtful that you could turn the, the object back into a subject on a, in a film format like that. I find that quite doubtful. What do you think about that? I think that um, I'm not actually buying to the objectifying uh, discourse around porn and representation in general. I'm very critical about that um, particular concept. And I think, well, I'm not, you know, uh, I could mention Mart Martin Nussbaum, uh, Nussbaum uh, about objectification and her uh, problems with pornography, but the kind of objecti objectification that is said to be stripping people from autonomy is also imposed by us, the things that, that think that uh, people are objectified. Yeah. I see people that have loads of strong subjectivity in the agency they uh, perform uh, through sex work or through um, performance or so, I don't know, I'm, I'm not buying to that kind of um, objectifying discourse too much, to be honest. Um, and I think porn is one of the ways of representing your own subjectivity, um, representing your own desires, your own pleasures, your own identity um, in particular ways. I'm not naive about all the implications, but I don't know. <laughs> Why, why do you think that it's impossible to... Could I just come back to you about that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> just, uh, what is it that you think is, is the problem about maybe coming back uh, from it, object to subject in, in terms of being filmed? It's the consumption side rather than the production side, I would 
as I would think. So I don't necessarily see that it's a problem of agency and being a subject in the production of the film. It's more a problem with the audience. It's likely to be, it's as a viewer, I would imagine it's quite difficult to imagine that person who you don't know as a three-dimensional person in the sense that the filmmaker was talking about. I, I don't agree with this. <laughs> I mean, if you see, maybe you haven't seen the right film then, because if you see some of the films of the Dirty Diaries that you were talking, they're really short films, you don't get to know the people, but you can see for like in three shots, you have an idea of this person as a person, not as an object or as a, I don't know, as a, a body. So it's just the way, it's, it depends on the film. Yeah, yeah I think there's a... Um we keep uh, we keep in, in talks. We have keep ha having some questions that um, um, it's like there's if you're interested in in this kind of porn that is being making, there's a lot of things available, or you can get in touch with people to get their films. But um, yeah, we keep having uh, this type of uh, questions that it's um, it's like. There are other things, and you know that's the main reason why so some people and artists nowadays are making their own films, making their own porn. It's because you know they have a voice that needs to be heard, and you know if if you if you're interested, you can you can you can see it. So it's not ex it's not always like that. Yeah, I don't agree as well. Like, it's not always objectified because I've seen things and so there is there of course it's not mainstream because it's too weird perhaps to be mainstream and a lot of people have told us as well with other things other films other performances that it doesn't turn them off on and so it's not really about that at least what we do because we don't do mainstream porn we just work with sexuality and we uh, it could be called porn but it's an exploration. I don't think it, it's not exactly to turn you on. It's not, I mean, we don't do like the kind of queer porn that it's been doing like in the US, like with uh, the Crash Pad series and all that. That's porn to turn you on. Um, not actually, objectified women at all, I don't actually think Actually, so. can I respond to that? Because once you said in an interview that um, post porn, for example, is mm. not about, you know, arousal per se, it's about yeah. politics. But actually I've interviewed people uh, that's it. and they said um, uh, that they've been exploring feminist porn because they wanted to know more, they wanted something uh, to investigate their own sexuality yeah. and they tried many, you know, they're very, very aware of what was out there and what they were seeing and they didn't like, uh, I don't know, Belladonna for example. Yeah. And when they found some shorts of post porn, yeah. they were, you know, that turns me on. Yeah, know? yeah, exactly. So, I mean, when I say it's not meant to turn you on, but it's, maybe, it's, maybe it's not the, the right way to say it. But it's it's not to reach a certain of a normalized desire yeah. that is out there. Instead, of, you know, when you're exploring something personal, you're not like, oh, it's going to be great. Everyone's going to be turned on by this because it's my own. Thing. So you don't think like that, but yeah, it's more about they were exploring. Able, and, yeah, yeah, they were able to, everyone, anyone can be turned. They were able to not. explore their own sexuality yeah, in their own course. terms, in a, in a yeah. you know, with a political awareness that was very very important to them. For example, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's it's a lot of a, it's a very conceptual thing to do, and I think, and there's a lot of thinking involved or at least a sort of a working awareness. So it's not an object at all. Got a question at the back. <laughs> Hello. Um, I read uh, something recently which was about um, the idea that whereas formerly people might become anxious or depressed because uh, they felt repressed within society. Now that we live in a very permissive, hedonistic society, actually people are becoming increasingly anxious and depressed because they feel they're not enjoying themselves enough. And there's a kind of pornography, a sort of superego pornography of 
you must enjoy yourself, you must be fulfilled, you must explore, you must risk, you must do all this stuff. And in a sort of postmodern way, you can say, you know, and, and therefore every, you know, everything's interesting, it's all a discourse. But the kind of, um, the totalizing effect of this is that they're increasing, I mean, we're not a happier society now than we have been. And I wonder if part of that's to do with the sort of alienating kind of um, qualities, like there's no possibility of having any subjective engagement. Or within pornography generally, it's quite, um, there is no subjective encounter, there's no storyline, there's, no, there's almost like the exact lack of that, the opposite of that, there's no intimacy, there's no sort of, um, I wonder if you have anything to say about that. Is that something that's kind of come up in, within porn studies or within any of your experiences? Like, is this sort of um, the impasse or the sort of threat of not not sort of enjoying oneself enough somehow? That's um, that's really uh, the modern condition, but not necessarily that porn is the cause of that. Because I think <laughs> it's more a symptom. I think. Well, it, it, yeah. It, uh, mm. Up to a point, I, um, the idea that there's no intimacy in pornography, I, um, th there are some forms of porn that, d without a doubt, eschew, absolutely reject any idea of intimacy. And then there are other kinds of porn for whom you know intimacy is a really key element and actually it seems to me that sometimes we um we don't have particularly good ways of thinking about intimacy in porn so for example um i was involved in a, a court case as an expert witness in a case relating to the obscene publications act uh, and regarding fisting gay fisting videos and actually um, the prosecution tried to show that these were really uh, violent and unpleasant, distasteful, problematic, risky, dangerous, all of those things. They were, in fact, some of the most intimate kinds of porn I've ever seen. And the amount of eye contact in those films was, you know, really quite mind-blowing in, in terms of, you know, and, and checking in and making sure that each other was okay. And, and this was very mainstream, gay fisting porn, by the way, not, not something that's on the periphery or coming from some ethical, you know, whatever, but actually very firmly in the mainstream. Was um, that linked to repressing the gay marriage bill? I, said, well, I think a lot of the time those, those yeah, things... Yeah, so. you know, the, the thing is that um, forms of intimacy, our understanding of forms of intimacy are, also, are often very uh, incredibly narrow yes. and very heteronormative and with a very particular sense of what ought to be intimacy. And, and then we try to regulate and legislate on, on unspokens, right? That, that actually we talk about violence and, and problems and obscenity and various other things when actually what we're talking about are things that make legislators feel rather uncomfortable uh, because they're not normative, they're not heteronormative, uh, procreative activities, but something else. Intimacy can be a feature of really um, so-called extreme <laughs> or obscene pornography. And I think it's really important that we don't lose sight of the fact that often, you know, uh, censorship comes down hardest on those things that uh, it finds most uncomfortable precisely mm. because actually it may well, it, it rocks the foundations of uh, our ideas about what intimacy ought to be. Right? Yeah, I don't, I don't disagree with that. I completely agree. I, I right. think I was thinking more in terms of like an emotional engagement. Uh, and I think that like um, it's been interesting to see that there have been like people trying to set up websites where instead of kind of... Um, a one-way encounter on the internet so you have a kind of like chat roulette and things like that and basically they become kind of master tools for people to masturbate across the internet and i think that there's um one of the founders of facebook's tried to set up a site which is where you're supposed to chat kind of it's a video conferencing thing you're supposed to make friends and it seems to always kind of become that same thing and um yeah, it's quite interesting. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, do, I, I don't want to throw out the idea that you mentioned at the start that people have real problems around sexuality. Some people have real problems around it. And the idea that, you know, everybody around us is much happier, much wealthier, much 
much more orgasmic, got bigger cock or, you know, whatever, and that they're having better orgasms than you. I mean, Stephen Heath was talking about that way back, uh, you know, and, I, and uh, you know, that kind of exhortation to to enjoy yourself and, and stuff. But th that that's also a feature of almost every aspect of of Western life, let's yeah. uh, cause okay. I, th I think we need to be clear it probably has a lot to do with the fact that, you know, le when people talk about neoliberalism. I'm not sure though that, that um, we, we, we need more vocabulary, I think, and understanding of what people are doing because, you know, for one, one group of people, maybe things are very, feel very alienating and for others, actually it feels incredibly welcoming and inclusive and you know that actually forms of intimacy are there and and the possibilities of communicating with other people so it's yeah <laughs> doesn't give you an answer. I, I mean I, I i just can't come down on one side or the other i don't know whether anybody else can yeah. or, oh. i agree with the idea of intimacy being so, so Different. That, yeah so they have these ideas of intimacies and maybe what sex is and also yeah maybe mainstream porn did a lot of that but that's why this is a great time to explore other perspectives and if you're not feeling included perhaps you can do something about it so make your own write about it and I, I think there are all ways in which you know the earlier question about user generated porn kind of feeds in there that um you know the possibilities for communication, you know, of breaking down feelings of isolation, that those have, those have become available to people through the internet, and not just through looking, actually. We are constantly focused on the idea of seeing things or being exposed to things through our eyes, but actually, you know, the internet has allowed people to communicate uh, oh, using it. typing, <laughs> uh, you know, or, or, or actually speaking to each other, that there are ways in which people engage in human interactions yeah. around There's sexuality. There's a big community yes. and in the blogs, internet, and people that are doing yeah. this exploring sexuality and they connect with each other. And I, I, I do think that, you know, mainstream culture is a mainstream popular culture, mainstream high culture as well, maybe is just as much implicated in the idea of dissatisfaction and alienation, you know, because it's... Yeah. It, it, there are all kinds of fa fantasies that were offered constantly, which are maybe unobtainable. But anyway. Hi. Um, I've just got a question, really, with regard to the consumption of pornography, because, I mean, whether or not we choose to consume pornography is entirely down to our own particular moral compasses, as it were. Um, but the way in which people tend to access it now is obviously through the internet, and there's a large degree of kind of copyright infringement and a, a legal framework there. And there's the, the article that you put up there, you know, the 11 year old that's accessing it, who is sort of a minor, not necessarily, you know, accountable for his own actions. I'm just wondering what that adds to the discourse here, this kind of notion of, you know, it, porn, as, as the Pornhub shot that you put up, all of those images were from commercially produced porn films, but no one's paying for them when they access them in that way. How does that affect the discourse? <laughs> well, I, 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 th I think the talk about ethics is really interesting because actually when it comes to things like Pornhub, but also lots of the queer porn sites and other sites, uh, very clearly people don't want to pay for porn, right? So they'll talk about victims in, the, in <coughs> sex work and, and they'll, you know, oh, it's objectifying or it's, it's really bad for people, it's immoral, etc. I'm not paying for it, as if somehow that's, that absolves you of any responsibility. And I think, you know, there are, there, are, there are some very significant questions that need to be asked here because, yes. There have been a few shame, kind of shame cases as well, haven't there, particularly in America with the Corbin Fisher. They went after a lot of people that were illegally downloading. And there was, I think it was in Germany as well where a lot of, I remember reading an article, a lot of students, gap year students, had actually received sort of warnings for downloading and consuming porn in that way. Yeah, I don't know whether you want to say anything about it. <laughs> I mean, it, it is a bind, right? Because people like Joanna Rangel, one of the, arguably one of the most famous 
once does in, in the world currently. She, she doesn't make a lot of money out of porn, right? Uh, I mean, she makes, she makes a living, but it's not, it's not a great deal of money. And then if you look on any of the porn hub sites, yes, her content is there, having been stripped out of DVDs or off her own website and put up as if there's no cost to her in that. And so there are individuals yeah. who are having real problems about, uh, you know, keeping a tight hold on their, their materials. And it, it's interesting, because it doesn't seem, um, from the research we did uh, with consumers, actually, it doesn't seem that people do the same thing as has happened with the mu music industry, where, you know, people use Spotify mm -hmm. or elsewhere to download, listen to something, and then go out and buy the, the CD. Um, that doesn't seem to be the process. Though there are people, there are still fairly, uh, well, it's, a, it's obviously a profitable area still of people who want to purchase pornography on DVD um, or will pay to um, have a monthly subscription or whatever it is. So, you know, and, and those are for different kinds of reasons. Sometimes it's around quality, other times it's around... Uh, a sense that they have a relationship with the with the company or the person whose work they're buying, and I I can see that that would probably be very much the case with some of the feminist and yeah. and queer porn. Um, I was mentioning Jis Lee, for example, yeah. and she has sorry they uh, has a uh, huge fan base, and they is a, a very very firm advocate of paying for your porn because it's a mean for them to live mm. and to produce quality porn, to be able to do many other projects. Also, um, you know, not, they was able to uh, pay back all the student loan before, <laughs> you know, before their uh, classmates at university, which is very rare for the for the American situation now, and they is pushing this uh, very very firmly. Uh, to produce quality porn, we need people to actually buy, and not just downloading it illegally. Hi, um, I guess picking up on that question away and also kind of connecting to the question of kind of ethical consumerism in porn. Um, I was wondering if you could say a little bit or knew a little bit about um, sort of sex workers organizing in the porn industry. I know there's been things like the sex worker university and things like that that have been really interesting and really productive as well. Um, and I, I wondered if kind of sex worker organizations had had kind of certain interesting effects for porn working conditions that you might have something to say about? No. Um, well, <laughs> uh, testing, um, AIDS testing, also uh, mobilizing against some of the uh, attempts at censorship um, in the US. I've just forgotten the number of the bill now, but the one that's going through for mandatory condoms, the uh, sex worker um, groups have been very vocal in their opposition to to mandatory condoms, so I think um, I think uh, I, I do think the idea that somehow maybe sex workers are not politicised or not uh, active is is really um, well. That's just we haven't been paying attention, probably. Right? That's that's uh, the only thing, and and also the difficulties of getting uh, that voice heard at times. Um, that seems that does seem to be changing quite considerably, actually, and I think that's a good thing. We had the question earlier about uh, the Nordic model, and you know, the most persuasive voice voices uh, to me seem to be those that come from sex workers themselves, who who are um, who problematise the idea of of um, penalising clients and, uh, and other protective strategy so yeah um and uh, i think you know the queer porn movement is actually that's coming out of that's grassroots and, and mm -hmm. the 
uh, post-porn movement as well is, is grassroots, maybe not necessarily aligned as a sex work, but, you know, th that's not, yeah, it's whether part, it's part of yeah. it, yeah. I, I don't know whether you want to. Whether you not, or not you believe in being a community, this grassroots, uh, you know, impulse yeah, creates a community and also a community of viewers yeah. that are actually identifying almost as the same in a way. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've probably got time for maybe one more question because I think we're approaching the end of our. Uh, okay. So, is, is there one more question from the audience? <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, an, it's, it's an assumption, but I, I assume that men access porn a lot more than women. With looking at sexuality like that your films are doing, do you think the female audience, if I'm right, the female audience will grow as more, shall we say, interesting and challenging looks or explorations about sexuality happen as people innovate and look at it, take it more seriously and look at it? I mean, I, I'm saying I assume that uh, pornography is mainly looked at by men. Oh, yeah. That's my assumption. Yeah. I think what you're doing isn't the same as pornography. It's looking and exploring sexuality and, and creating a discussion around that through your film. Do you think that will encourage more women to access porn? I don't think, I think there's much more women watching porn than people think. Maybe they don't say it, but I think almost everyone, not every day, but I mean, everyone has seen something or, um, I think this idea is a bit, how do you know, you know? Yeah, I, I don't, <laughs> I don't think this is happening. Also, yeah, it's, there's this idea that it's, it's great for a man to watch porn, so everyone's to, every m man is talking loud about it, that, about porn. But maybe there are more women looking at it that we know. Now that if our films or any other films will encourage to watch porn, I don't know exactly if there's someone who's watching in our film thinking that I want to watch more porn. Maybe they will be encouraged to explore a bit more what different kinds yeah. of se sex films you can find and see that it's not only what you see on yeah, porn, hope or whatever it is. You can find other things, maybe that will lead men and women to explore and find other websites, other, other filmmakers. Yeah, and present a different, perhaps different aesthetics, different mood. Uh, you know, I'm more, I think this is more like video art, some people call it video art, some people call it more porn, erotic, I don't know, so. I, th I think that's, that was what I was wondering, if, if we you experiment with porn more, because I think it is ma mainly male, you know, from a male perspective, will more films be made from a female perspective about sexuality? But what is a female perspe perspective? Perspective and male perspective. Well, I know, I know what a male perspective, but I, I don't know what a female perspective is. But is it not like something really in your head? So I can yeah. do a, a film with a male perspective if I want to, isn't it? Like this is, this is a construction. So I don't know. I think we should erase this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, in this kind of exploration of sexuality and gender, I mean. We're always like, what is a female? What is a male? So what is a female perspective? But I understand what you mean, but I think after a certain point, we, sh we don't see things like that. And I think people should go, sh should think about it, to not see it as that. Because it's too, it's binary kind of way of thinking and it's too narrow, I think. And it's, I mean, and then that, that will, what happens with that is that we do something, someone else does something exploring these concepts and it's always going to be porn made by females for females. Some people I call it and we don't think it's that. We don't think it's made by females. I mean, who, 
who's there to say that we are females if not us and I mean, it's not made for females and yeah. <laughs> so, okay did you this really an open answer you know <laughs> I'm not saying yes or no so I just it's up there. But it is, it is a real um, dilemma because you're right. Most most studies demonstrate that men are more comfortable with looking at pornography, much more likely to purchase pornography, um, much more likely just to view it uh, in general. But whether or not women need to aspire to be like men in that way that that's an, another issue too right and, and maybe you know one of the questions is uh, it, it might be um, good to think about ways in which porn could change uh, our understandings or, or films like yours could change our understandings of what what constitutes sexuality sex for for everyone and so instead of this idea that it, it, it's heteronormative, etc., that you know there could be a comfort in watching other people's intimacies without those then immediately feeling like they, because there's a lot of discomfort around porno pornography as well, right? That actually, whilst men, heterosexual men, may look at a lot of, of porn, they may constitute the biggest audience. They're certainly the one that uh, most of the com commercial endeavours are are targeted to. Um, it's an incredibly narrow range of stuff that's available. Uh, and then we talk about men's sexuality as being like that in this very narrow trajectory. But actually, oh, is it? Do we know that? We don't, you know, that actually this is the stuff that people know will market, they can sell in that way. That doesn't mean to say that that's what men, male sexuality is like. And it would be, it would be great to think of a a, a time not too distant and rather utopian like where people could, could actually all people could m make a choice to look at porn or not actually because there's no requirement you know to yeah. no one has to no one has to like it or any of it or all of it or anything yeah, else but it's bit. open and it's yeah. discussed and it's sort of like you were saying and um, that's just the films for for uh for men, it's like this Hollywood films, uh, uh, action films that are made for men, and then romantic comedies for women. You know, it, it feels like it's like that with porn, but, you know, I mean, to, to um, change all these ideas, <laughs> it, it might be ut it, utopic to imagine, you know, just change it, and now action now for women. It's, it's not even that the, the main goal, but that's why it's important to keep discussing and to have people talking about it, writing about it, making it. Yeah, in a way, you know. I mean, the film that we showed, uh, Corpus Co, was trying a little bit this by showing uh, gay sex with all male without a cum shot or, you know, trying to show some intimacy and some sex, but without being, yeah, the typical sort of way of showing it. And yeah, but, but we never thought that was for male or female while doing yeah, it. Yeah, no. Is it just we just wanted our to do it. Personal take on it. What we wanted to see for it. There is one way that. <laughs> Should we have one more question? <laughs> oh, it's a response. Um, when you were talking, a uh, part of the discussion earlier I was it, that we've just had, I was kind of thinking that. Um, uh, pleasure is linked to privilege, you know what mm. I mean? And I think that, that there's something that isn't getting addressed when we're grappling with what is this male perspective. I don't know that that's the best way of addressing it, but that uh, people with power and privilege comfortably have their pleasure needs met. And I think that we can uh, problematise that dynamic by saying pleasure is a feminist issue. So how are people without privilege, how might then pleasure needs be met? And I think that there's a temptation to think that pleasure is a frivolous issue. Mm. But if we think about how 
if our pleasure needs are met, we may be more connected people. We may feel um, more empowered. We may have more agency. That may be a way of rethinking the kind of um, circular discussions. So th there's a politics to um, there's a politics to addressing the needs of people who aren't in positions of privilege and who don't have gender privilege. So that I, that that was just a a response I wanted to <laughs> offer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, maybe on that response we should <laughs> draw to a close. Um, I just have to say thank you all uh, very much for coming. Thank you to Lola, Mariana, Clarissa and Alessandra um, for a really like, stimulating uh, discussion. And thank you all uh, very much for, for coming. So.